Well, good morning, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Revolution 250 podcast. I am Bob Allison, the chair of the Revolution 250 Advisory Group. Rev 250 is a consortium of 70 organizations in and around Massachusetts looking at ways to commemorate the beginnings of the American Revolution. And we are delighted today to have as our guest Karen Wolf who is the executive director of the Omohundro Institute in Williamsburg, one of the premier organizations, I should say the premier organization for the study of the early American history. And she is also a professor at the College of William and Mary. So thank you for joining us, Karen. It's delightful to be here. Thank you for asking me. I think so. So I know that the, uh, in, in, in addition to being a professor, director of the Omohundro Institute, which publishes the William and Mary Quarterly, you're also one of the chefs of Scholarly Kitchen, which is an online platform for all kinds of historians who do tremendous things. And also one of the founders of the website, Women Also Know History, which is a great database of women who are engaged in the study of history. And you've written a, number of books about women in the colonial revolutionary period, in addition to the work you do with the Omohundro Institute and as a professor. So can you tell us a little bit about what or how the Omohundro Institute is looking at commemorating the 250th anniversary? Wow, that's a big question. Um, so we're the short version is we're doing a lot. Uh, we have been thinking about 2026 um, for gosh, the better part of a decade now. I think um, for many folks of my generation, the bicentennial was a really signal moment in thinking about um, the American Revolution. And we also know, um, this was particularly influential for me when I was in graduate school, how much wonderful scholarship came out of the bicentennial as a publisher, but also as a convener of um, early American scholars and scholarship and as an organization that aims to make that scholarship and historical expertise widely available to the public, we are thinking a lot about what kinds of scholarship we can produce in this commemorative period um, that can be a gift to the nation and a gift to the future. So we've got lots going on under that basic rubric. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, Scholarly Kitchen, which is the uh, the blog of the Society for Scholarly Publishers, and um, most of the folks who write for that um, blog are scientists and technologists because that's where scholarly publishing mostly is. But I think scholarly publishing in history in particular has so much to offer the public, and in fact, I think has a lot to teach our colleagues in science and STEM disciplines as well, which is why I'm interested in, in working with it. And one of the things that is most, I think, back and forth and um, synergistic there is the way that scientists as well as humanists are thinking about how we reach public audiences. Um, and the other thing that's interesting is how we think about how public audiences inform what it is that we're doing. In other words, we have particular kinds of expertise and the public um, there are lots of communities in the public that have particular kinds of expertise. How can we synergize and learn from one another? So um, let me let me see if I can break down um, just one example from your question about what the OI is actually doing. What are some of the specific things we're doing um, to think about how scholars can contribute to this incredible um, commemorative opportunity of 2026? One of those is thinking about um, how we help build infrastructure for research. So uh, we know that for a long time, you and I, as um, scholars of early America, we have relied on some really important um, infrastructure for our research in the form of documentary editions. These documentary editing projects of um, the so-called founding fathers, um, Washington, Adams, Jefferson have been critically important to how we understand the government in British America, both pre and post revolution, but they've also helped us see into the worlds which are not as well documented. Um, 
I like to quote Doug Bradburn at, at Mount Vernon when he gave this uh, talk at the 50th anniversary of the George Washington Papers, where he said, you know, we would, we know so much about enslaved people at Mount Vernon in large part because of the work that documentary editors have done on the papers of George Washington. In other words, these are projects that help us to see things that um, that those folks who are writing those materials didn't necessarily intend um, for us to see. So the OI is thinking about in the same way, how can we help build research infrastructure that helps us see beyond elites and beyond the kind of the, the world of the colonies along the East Coast. One of the projects that we participated in that um, is the Georgian Papers Program, which I think you um, wanted to talk about a little bit. So I'll, I'll stop there and see if you want to yeah. um, follow up a little bit before I keep monologuing, sorry. Well, no, the monologue is great. And so you did mention the Georgian Papers Project. And I, I, again, it's interesting, these documentary projects on the founders aren't simply a hagiography, but they really do allow us to see this world because they wrote about so much. And yeah. Washington, of course, was a planter and he's really involved in the day-to-day -day working, almost obsessively with the day-to-day -day mm -hmm. workings of Mount mm -hmm. Vernon. So there's, mm -hmm. as you said, a lot we can learn that Washington probably didn't intend. And so yeah. they are a tremendous resource of to mine these and really get at these stories. So, um, Absolutely. You know, just down the street from you at the Mass Historical Society, they're doing such wonderful work on the Adams Papers. Yes. Um, you know, generations of editors doing incredibly detailed, important work to transcribe those editions, to mm -hmm. annotate them. Yes. So in other words, to give us deep background and then to digitize those and make them available to all of us. Um, yeah. Founders Online is one of my absolute yeah. go to resources oh, yeah. Yeah. and undergraduates and the public alike. Fantastic right. resource with all of this material yeah. digitized. You know, you think about it that we have access to things that other uh, previous generations would have to go travel to places and we can sit at home in our pajamas. Not that we do this and <laughs> have it at our fingertips things that Henry Adams couldn't get or yeah. other hist previous historians. So we really live in a yeah. tremendous age for doing this kind of work. Thanks yeah. to these archival yeah. projects. I think it's extraordinary. Just this morning, I was um, I was up early um, writing. Whatever else I do, I'm a historian first. Anyway, I was up early this morning, and I was on the Maryland Archive site reading um, digitized material of the 17th century laws of Maryland. It's incredible, really, the um, the public um, goodwill and the public good that is served by mm -hmm. this kind of investment in our past, making this stuff available to us. I think it's a critical piece of our democratic process and philosophy to make our past available to us as widely as possible. It really is. And so we've also been thinking a bit about what will be the legacy of the 250th. And we've seen the advances that came with the bicentennial, with the um, actually looking at underrepresented voices. I mean, so much work on women, African-Americans, Native Americans yep. came after that. So just thinking of how we can use our moment to make this more available to a next generation of scholars, for, for the generations of scholars. So we have a yep. tremendous opportunity, it seems. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, one thing that uh, I think both you and I know is that the scholarship in early American history has transformed really since the bicentennial. Um, and, you know, uh, the OI uh, likes to call this vast early America. We, we yeah. have a hashtag, social media hashtag vast early America, but we really believe in this concept of an early America that is really continental, that incorporates the Caribbean and global contexts as well, but that really helps us understand British America as embedded in a kind of much larger, wider context. And there's another dimension to that vast early American perspective too, that's been revealed through decades of scholarship now since the bicentennial. And that is that we know that the 18th century history of places that are part of the United States now are just as important for our understanding yeah. mm -hmm. of our nation. So, you know, uh, California has an 18th century history that's just as important to our nation now as Philadelphia's 18th century history. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about vast early America, we are resting on decades of scholarship, decades of history mm -hmm. that have shown us this much wider 
early America, a much deeper early America. Mm -hmm. It's diverse geographically. It's diverse in terms of the people that we see. We know that by the time of the revolution, uh, you know, what we now think of as the geography of the American nation is still predominantly native. Um, mm -hmm. And it is fundamentally um, in the in British America, it is, you know, a 40% of the population are enslaved um, African or African descended people. So this is a really diverse place, not to mention diversity among Europeans um, mm -hmm. and European descended people. It's a really diverse and complicated place. And portraying the diversity, the complexity, the violence of that 18th century world is, I think, really essential for us in this 250th moment. Um, really? And this, the scholarship that the OI has been supporting since the bicentennial, I think, helps us get there. It really does. Now, can you tell us a bit about the Georgian Papers Project, another of these sure. tremendous enterprises? Sure. And the GPP um, actually fits into this. It won't sound like it at first um, and uh, easy for anyone to find georgianpapers.com. So the Georgian Papers program is a collaborative project that began um, with the Royal Collection Trust, which operates the archives at Windsor Castle um, of Her Majesty, the Queen of England and um, and etc. Uh, it's a collaboration between uh, the Royal Archives at Windsor, King's College London, the OI, um, and our founding sponsors, William and Mary. And this project uh, has set out to digitize the Georgian papers that are in the Royal Archives, hundreds of thousands of pages, many of them for us of keen interest, um, George III's materials, to digitize those, to make them publicly available. And you can see on georgianpapers.com, there's direct access to the scanned materials, but there's also um, a, a direct port to the work that our colleagues at William & Mary Libraries have been doing on transcribing some of those materials. You can do see that at transcribegeorgianpapers.wm.edu. Um, uh, and also uh, interpretive uh, exhibits that we've done, online exhibits, videos of events that we've hosted. But I think the real heart for the OI of the Georgian Papers program is that, yes, it's neat to see what George III is doing and thinking in the middle of 1776 or 1780 or whatever. Yes, that is neat. But the real thing here is that we can do exactly what you and I were just talking about with the papers of Washington and Jefferson. Um, I mean, to use one of my very favorite examples, um, uh, Erica Dunbar's work on Ona Judge, the woman who ran for her freedom from George Washington. That yeah. book is an extraordinary example of how you can take the papers of George Washington and you can reveal the work of, um, you can reveal the lives of someone who George Washington never intended us to know very much about. Um, the Georgian Papers Program sitting right at the heart of Anglo-Imperial power there, right at the heart in the round tower at Windsor Castle can nonetheless help us illuminate that full world of slavery in the British Caribbean, of uh, the, Brit the full British Atlantic. In other words, we can do the same thing we have done with the papers of Washington and Adams and so on, take that very rich documentary material and we can make that speak to a much wider, diverse, complex, world, that world that we need to see into in order to really appreciate the foundations of our nation. So it's an exciting project. It really is. A few weeks ago, Rick Atkinson was with us and he based a lot of his book on what he found thanks to the Georgian Papers Project. So Yeah. Yeah. I love how Rick opens that book by describing how he walks up the stone steps. I, he counted yeah. the steps. I don't remember how many there are. I can yeah. just tell you there are a lot because every time I've walked up those stone steps into the round tower, I thought, wow, this is a lot of steps, yeah. <laughs> but it's a wonderful way to open the book. Yeah. It's really it fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So. So it, uh, is the, um, the quarterly William and Mary quarterly planning any commemorations of the 250th? So we've got a whole variety of things planned actually for 2026. As I said, um, you know, we've been thinking about this for a long time. We began the collaboration with the Georgian Papers Program in 2014. And I can tell you that when I was in an event in London um, in 2015, um, giving a presentation to a big group of 
people and I said, well, the reason that the OI is into this is because 2026 is coming. And I can tell you that not many people in London in 2014 were like, what are you talking about? Yeah. We've really been pretty, pretty focused on this. And in fact, um, the quarterly collaborated with the Journal of the Early Republic um, several years ago on a joint issue called Writing to and from the Revolution. Wonderful opening introduction um, from Alan Taylor. Um, talking about and really assessing some of the scholarship since the era of the bicentennial. And I, I highly recommend, there's a fantastic historiographical piece in there uh, by Michael McDonald and David Wallstriker, which uh, looks at sort of where have we come um, in terms of scholarship um, and, and, and does a nice, all, some quantitative, but also very deeply qualitative analysis of the material published in our Field leading journal, the way of Mary Quarterly, on the revolution since the since the year of the bicentennial. Um, so, uh, so we have really been kind of stacking towards 2026, and we've got a lot more stuff rolling out. We have um, we have a podcast, as you know, that we sponsor, Ben Franklin's World, um, and a second podcast called Doing History. We've got a lot of um, revolution focused revolution broadly conceived focus material there. We have digital projects that we have been um, investing in um, and we have books. Um, Rob Parkinson's new book, 13 Clocks from the famous quote about getting the colonies yeah. to chime yeah. is 13, you know, 13 clocks chiming is one is actually released this May. Um, so we are, um, I could not put a finger on one thing we're doing. We have a pretty big program. I think like, you know, like you guys at, at Rev 250 and so many like-minded organizations, um, we all see 2026 as an extraordinary opportunity to talk about the 18th century that we know from the scholarship and that we can use that scholarship to interpret our public spaces, um, that we can hear from communities that have different memories and histories and knowledges of that 18th century. It's an incredible opportunity, I think, um, to bring history to the public good. It really, it really is. Of course, in 2014 and 2015, we were also talking about 2026 being not that far away in Boston, yeah. and we got a lot of blank looks. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Even in Boston. OK, so in Even London, in I was getting very blank, yeah. more yeah. than yeah. blank. So, yeah. yeah. So yeah. So. So good, but you know, this is what we do is we think about these, uh, even though we are, we look to the past, we are looking ahead and thinking about this uh, big moment. We knew that the, the bicentennial in Boston, they really only got started about a year or two before as the then mayor thought wow. this is an important okay. thing. And wow. the queen came okay. actually to the, for the bicentennial. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, and, and, so do you see, as, as um, in your position with the Omohundro Institute, can you give us any sense of new scholarship you have seen emerging that's particularly interesting, new directions that people are taking? Well, I think, um, gosh, there is so much. Um, you know, the extraordinary vibrancy of the early American field is just a continual inspiration. That's the thing I actually love most about my job is that I'm always, always learning. Um, yeah. It's just, it's just genuinely inspiring and always exciting. Um, and to see what new graduate students are doing, to see what seasoned mm -hmm. scholars are coming up with, it's tremendously exciting. I guess if I had to point to a couple of things that I think, um, you know, uh, the people might not, uh, the public at large might not think about early America. I would, I would say three things. Um, one is the extraordinary methodological innovation in the study of slavery and enslaved people. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, sometimes people think, oh gosh, there's, there's so much more information now out there about this subject. And that's true. There is in the public. Um, you know, sometimes due to projects like the 1619 Project or the Washington Post did a really wonderful project um, in the summer of 2019 on teaching slavery in K through 12 schools. Um, but honestly, this, the scholarship is so rich and it's partly, it's just begun to kind of scratch the surface of what we can know and how we can know it. Scholars of slavery and the enslaved have really shown us tremendously important new ways to use the archival materials 
that have survived from the 18th century have shown us how to look around the edges and through the written records and to the form, very format of the written records um, and have really, um, this innovation I think um, will iterate across our uh, fields of, of inquiry. So that's, that's one that's clearly enormously important. The second, I think, is um, the insights of scholars of Native American and Indigenous studies. And again, mm -hmm. there's both, we have m so much more actual information. Scholars have been doing such extraordinary work in the many, many, many Native communities, tribes, and nations um, in 18th century North America but also the kind of innovative ways that scholars of Native American and indigenous studies have been exploring those subjects are helping us to see all kinds of things in new ways. Um, so that's, I guess those are two. And then the third, I think is, um, it seems more conventional perhaps, but is actually also quite innovative. And that is in thinking about the nature of imperial structures and the development of nation state structures. Mm -hmm. That scholarship has also been quite innovative, looking at the rise of a financial state and how powerful that state is, mm -hmm. looking at the integrated um, uh, ways in which the British imperial officials are functioning um, you know, in London and then all across the empires, not just in North America, but how they're beginning to operate, of course, um, in Asia and, and elsewhere, but the rise really of the power of a financial um, state. Mm -hmm. that, that may sound a little dry to some, but honestly, it's crucially important as well. The, and all three of these, I think, are areas that help us understand um, the kind of the nature of the world in the 18th century. And, you know, often yeah. when people talk about 2026, they talk about the foundation of the nation. And I agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that the foundation of the nation in that 18th century moment has to account for that 18th century as itself the product of centuries of history and mm -hmm. as a place that was enormously complex. Um, oh, yeah. And the better we know it, the better we understand that foundation mm -hmm. for the nation. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly the people who were alive then were thinking about themselves in this much broader context than they weren't thinking about us necessarily. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, you know, we can think of, they were futurists in some, in some mm -hmm. respects, yeah, you know, yeah. thinking about what they were going to pass on to the next generations, mm -hmm. but they certainly were themselves product of their products of their history, just as mm -hmm. we are products of ours. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, we should probably let you talk a little bit about your current work. You're doing a project on lineage and genealogy and yes. politics connection in Britain and America. And I wonder if you could tell yeah. us a little bit. It sounds like a fascinating project. Oh, thank you for asking. You know, every scholar, there's nothing like being asked about your own research to inspire the real monologuing, right? Yes. Um, I'll, I'll try to be brief. So this is actually a project that has roots um, in decades of research. Um, and it's a book that looks at um, how uh, British Americans, so I'm very focused on um, British America, uh, so those British mainland colonies, um, and how British Americans used genealogy and um, actually created genealogy and why they did so. And that, you know, it kind of has, I guess it's got a couple of different um, ways in which that's significant. One is that genealogy is such a powerfully popular pastime right now. Um, and I think we tend to think of it as a kind of pastime and um, as a kind of pleasant hobby. Certainly, I do not do any genealogy myself, but I have had relatives who, who have. Um, but genealogy um, is more than that. It's actually, it is a practice of the state and of governments. And we know that in um, dramatically cruel um, ways. The Nazis, after all, were powerfully genealogically driven. We know that there are other kinds of genealogical st state structures across time and space. Um, and part of what I'm trying to do in the, for the 18th century is to show how individuals and families create family histories and genealogies that are deeply meaningful to them, you know, that have this mm -hmm. deep affective quality and also how genealogy becomes an instrument of government and other institutions. Um, the principal example of that would be through slavery. 
and the structure of slavery and um, maternal descent, the laws of maternal descent. So it's a book that both looks at how people are super attached to these very dear objects that they create, whether it's texts or whether they are, um, you know, images or actual objects that they create um, as family memories and pass along, um, and also the way that the state begins to aggregate information about family relationships for its mm -hmm. own own interests. Great. So it's a book that's been a long time coming, but um, I am in the cleanup footnotes stage. So that Very is good. both a fun stage and a semi-torturous. It's why I was at the Maryland Archives online this okay. morning, yeah. actually, at 530. Great. So. <laughs> Great. so we're talking with Karen Wolf, the director of the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture, professor of history at the College of William and Mary. And so we've been talking a bit about the 250th and I know down the road from you, Yorktown has a museum of the American Revolution that we've seen. Yes. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that. It's a terrific place. Yes, it is. And and newly refreshed um, mm -hmm. and and quite, quite impressive, I must say. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's there's so much um, early British American history in the kind of Williamsburg, um, Yorktown, Jamestown area, and so many folks doing really important work. One thing that I think is impressive about the way that I've seen folks in our area, and I'm sure I know in Boston as well, approaching the 250th is not just a focus on 1776 and 2026 as being emblematic of 1776, yeah. but of kind of a wider early American history. So folks looking at um, you know, obviously Yorktown doesn't want to miss its opportunity, and that did not happen in 1776. Um, but also folks at Jamestown um, and folks um, at Native communities um, throughout the peninsula and elsewhere thinking about how 1776 um, and our 250th anniversary is an opportunity to interpret those histories and bring them to the public mm -hmm. and have public conversations um, as well. So I think that's enormously important. I'm really proud there of what is. we're doing in Virginia as well as, um, of course, at yep. the OI. You should be. And the uh, the museum in Yorktown has a digital liberty tree, which asks visitors what liberty means to you. It's a way of engaging with an audience and getting you to think about this, as opposed to showing you the artifact. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I well, I I think a lot of museums are doing really innovative work. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, with public engagement around thinking about what do these things mean. I know that that Liberty Tree is really, it's a little creepy actually sometimes because yeah. the lights on it. It's a yeah. low, in a low lit room, right? Um, but it is highly effective. And I, I was not there with kids, but I, and I wasn't there um, seeing any little kids interact with it, but I suspect they mm -hmm. would find it really exciting, but it's visually yeah. quite stunning. Um, yeah. But I think the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia is doing really exciting work. One thing I would link there with both of those um, is uh, the kind of intentionality around thinking about how liberty was interpreted widely differently. So mm -hmm. um, often I find that undergraduate students are quite struck by how liberty um, is not a straightforward thing that the patriots are offering. Obviously, in Virginia, we think a lot about Dunmore's proclamation and mm -hmm. Lord Dunmore, the last uh, rural governor, and his F, his um, outreach to enslaved people to join the British um, and gain their freedom. And, you know, that's that is a um, that is a move for liberty. Um, that is mm -hmm. a move for liberty that the patriots are not allowing. In other words, the patriots are not they're not the sole possessors. Of, um, right. of liberty, nor the, not the language of liberty, nor the concept of liberty, nor even the act of granting yes. liberty. And I think we could say the same for um, for lots of Native Americans as well, that, you know, the patriots mm -hmm. do not offer the best opportunity for sovereignty or independence. Mm -hmm. So the That's complexity great. of that, I think, is something that I find really exciting about a lot of the public engagement work. It really is. So we do live in an exciting time for thinking about history and doing this kind of historical work that um, you are doing. So we have been talking with Karen Wolf, the executive director of the Omohundro Institute for Early American History and Culture, and also a professor of history at the College of William and Mary. And it's really great to have an opportunity to talk with you. 
Thank you so much. This has really been great. I'm I'm ex super excited about the work that you all are doing at Rev250, and every time I learn more about it, I'm more excited. So I'm hoping well, for lots of collaboration. So are we. So thank you very much. So thank you, and thank you to Jonathan Lane, who is Rev250's coordinator and our producer. And now we'll have uh, Dave Emmerich, Peter Emmerich, and Doug Quigley pipe us out with the road to Boston. So thank you for joining us.